And hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy. I'm your host. And today I'm privileged to have on our show, Gary Hayslip. You may have heard about Gary, but if not, you're certainly going to remember his name after this episode because he has done so many things and contributed so much to the industry over the years that I absolutely wanted to share some time with him on the show. So welcome, Gary. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. Well, one of the things I wanted to start out with is I'd like to, uh, for folks to understand a little bit about backgrounds. Now, you weren't always a CISO. Obviously, none of us are born that way. But tell me a little bit about kind of what you got started on and what kind of moved you in this general direction. Um, actually, I was in the military. And uh, my job in the military was, you know, in the advanced electronics field. And, you know, computers are, tend to be in everything. And so, I mean, I got more and more involved with computers, you know, while I was in the military and, uh, and then started actually, you know, I built my own lab, started paying for my own certs, started working extensively in networks. And that was when the, um, when the U.S. Navy realized I had actually earned all of this experience in these certs on the side, you know, and also doing my regular job you know, working in, on, you know, working in weapon systems and stuff. And so they uh, started using me for both jobs. And so my, you know, so my first role actually was a CIO. You know, I was actually a CIO uh, for the U.S. Navy for some of the commands on the West Coast and was major, you know, was managing large networks and multiple teams of security and network and IT professionals. And after multiple CIO roles, I honestly just kind of got gravitated more and more towards security. Yeah, I just was fascinated by it. I was fascinated with how networks were built and how they could be broken into and how they were hacked. And I was constantly playing with things and breaking things and figuring out how things work. And it just, I just gravitated towards security. And I think that happens to a lot of us that get involved as well. I also had a background in the Navy. And as I had told in a couple other episodes, when I really wanted to do security full time, I was told, quote, the Navy has no need for computer security. And that's why I was trying, got my orders canceled to go to NSA. And so I ended up finishing a career as a reservist. But yeah, I think uh, military gives us a great start. And in doing so, you get an opportunity to take that initiative, as you've seen. And as we know in the Navy, hard work is its own reward. And if you achieve well and you do a lot of extra, they say, oh, wow, great. He can handle it. Let's give him something else. And But eventually, at some point in time, you chose to kind of... Uh, part ways with the Navy, uh, what was, what was the cause or what was, any, was there anything in particular or just it was time to go or there's like a really lucrative offer no, on the I mean, outside? You know, I, I was finishing up my career, you know, cause I actually did 20 years in the Navy, you know, and I retired and I switched over to civil service. I mean, so I was still working for the federal government and I was at that role at that time, I was a deputy CIO and a CISO, you know, so I was supporting the CIO. And I was also running, you know, as the acting CISO, I was running security teams. I was running network teams. I was filling a chief privacy officer role as well. And it was pretty wide ranging. And I actually did that for about six years, you know. But what happened was, was in that six year time frame, I um, finished up my MBA and was working extensively with cyber startups. There's a very close knit cyber startup community here in San Diego. And so I was working with a lot of these cyber startups and I just decided I needed to make real money. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> really always helpful. Came, yeah. yeah. was really what it come down to, you know, it's a bad habit. I got to eat, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, but, but, but also I have to admit, you know, my, my supervisor, I mean, you know, my, my boss, the CIO that I was working for a uh, gentleman by the name of Palmer Taskeru. He was, he was Sweden. Awesome guy. Um, he was Swedish and he was, he was, he was a riot. But he was someone that basically went ahead and told me as I was finishing up my MBA, he basically said, hey, you've outgrown it here. I have nothing for you. You're going to sit in this cubby for the next 20 years and probably jump out a window. And he goes, better yet, he goes, if you don't leave, I'm going to fire you. Well, that's that's actually some good, solid, uh, tough career of advice in a way, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and the thing about it is we've stayed friends yeah, you know, that was years ago, and we're still friends, and we still periodically check on each other. And he was one of my first um, mentors, and and he was. He just said, you know, it's time for you to move. 
He goes, you know, you've done as much as you can here. He goes, you know, and I don't see you stagnating and just sitting here. He says, you need to leave and, and move on. And that was in 2013. And that's when I took all, that's why I actually became the CISO for the city of San Diego. And I was the first CISO that they had had, you know, and so I had to build out a, a cybersecurity program. I, you know, it was interesting because the city is basically a $5 billion business. I mean, you know, it's 40 departments, 12,000 employees. You know, it's a mixture of police departments and libraries and water treatment facilities. You got every type of really kind of technology you can think of. And then connections to all kinds of different agencies, you know, for the federal government and the state government. And you got to work with all of that and protect all of that. You know, and then at the same time, you're in the middle of massive smart city projects. And it was it was a good four years. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a good transition from coming from the military in the federal government. So to me, this was kind of like halfway out the door, you know, and and I was I was enjoying it and building and mentoring my teams and, and actually working with the startup community in San Diego because I had multiple cyber startups as part of my um, my security program at the city. But even then, there came a time where I was like, OK, now I'm ready for private industry. And it just happened to be one of the startups that I was working with um, got purchased by Webroot, you know, Webroot Software, cybersecurity company. And I helped them do their due diligence when they purchased that um, that startup. And as they were wrapping up due diligence, we were actually at RSA. And they were like, yeah, hey, we could use uh, CISO. What do you guys, what do you think? And I was like, tell me more. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and it was fun. I mean, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was there for almost three years. Uh, but the company got acquired. Yeah, yeah it was Carbonite company. that bought it, right? Yeah, yeah. Carbonite went ahead and and bought Webroot, and they already had their own CISO. And so I helped with the whole transition, and actually worked on the product side for a while. And then I, it was just the product side was really cool, but I missed managing teams. I missed the security piece. I mean, it's for me, it's more than a job. It, it's 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 a passion. I'm always fascinated with technology. And I, I missed it, you know, and so I went ahead and I left Webroot and I actually did consulting for a couple of months while I was, um, while I was job, you know, hunting. And that's when SoftBank came in, you know, and that's when um, my boss out of the blue uh, reached out and uh, Will, you know, Will Bolivar reached out and said, uh, hey, let's talk. And, you know, he was looking for a CISO that could do security operations, but he had a whole, he had this strategy, this plan of flipping the whole company and moving everything to complete cloud. The world, we would have nothing on-prem, no hybrid, we'd be full SaaS, you know, we'd be full cloud. And what he needed was someone who, you know, a CISO that could do the security operations piece, that could handle audits, that could help with due diligence on the deals teams, but also knew, understood networks that didn't mind getting their hands dirty and was ready to build something new. I was like, sign me up. I was like, this is cool. You know, let's do it. And um, two and a half years later, I'm still at it. And it's, 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 it's been a train ride. It's been a lot of fun. It sounds fascinating. I, I mean, I, when I think about financial institutions and cloud, the cap one comes to mind. And I remember I was seeing a guy that uh, I was at a conference and I think I think it kind of went from he had a T-shirt. It had like a five and a quarter inch floppy disk to a three and a half inch floppy disk to a CD to a USB until finally a cloud image on there. It was kind of like the progression of evolution. And I said, that's a great shirt. Where did you get that? He said, I work for Capital One. It's our it's our shirt. We're a cloud company that has a banking habit. And I'm not trying to make an ad for him one way or the other. I just thought it was rather interesting that that was their uh their approach toward how they did things. But so you're able to do that at SoftBank. And I guess the question is, you know, the first CISO job that you had had when you came in there and you kind of worked your way in there with the Navy, but then when you came to the city of San Diego, when you start with absolutely a clean slate, you're not relieving anybody. You're not taking over from a success or a failure. You're basically somebody says, hey, we need to colonize this part of the business. Um, and there's probably... Other than startups, I would say fewer and fewer opportunities for people to do that. But in general, what do you think that was the the lesson learned? What type of attitude do you need to take in that as compared to, hey, step in and fill in for somebody else who's moving on? You know, it was 
I have to admit, it was surreal because I remember my my first week I came in there. I'm reporting to the CIO. Basically, I'm I'm reporting to the the director of IT who reports to the the deputy chief operating officer. And so I'm I'm reporting to the city CIO, and you know, and my office is right down the hall from his. And I come in and, and I chat with him. We're doing our first one on one. I've moved into my office. I'm kind of getting things set up, and you know, I'm already kind of planning as to what I'm probably going to need for my team. And I remember walking in and talking to him. Yeah, I think we're going to, you know, I'd like to go ahead and use the, I plan on using NIST as our framework. And um, and I'm already looking at what controls we're going to put in place. And he just looked at me and he goes, what's a framework? <laughs> I started laughing. <laughs> and I started laughing. And it, and it was like, first I was like, holy crap, this guy doesn't know what NIST is. or doesn't know what, you know, a framework is. But then I thought when I, you know, and I was kind of nervous, explained it to him. And then I went back to my office and I thought to myself, this is total Greenfield. I could seriously screw up here and no one's going to freaking know because they have no <laughs> idea what I'm doing. You know, and then it um, it just dawned on him. I said, I, and, you know, and it started clicking in my head. I'm like, I've got a lot of room to move here. I can maneuver, set things around. I can build stuff the way I've always wanted it instead of inheriting something from somebody else and having to spend, you know, your first six months to a year tearing things down and moving things around to the way you want it. I'm starting from scratch, you know, and it was, I have to admit, it was, it was different. Some of the lessons I learned right away were in those type of environments, because basically the city is like, you know, a it's private industry. It's like a regular business. They don't have to do cyber if they don't want to. <laughs> you know, you know, I had I had departments there that were their own business units making 100, 200 million. They were generating revenue, you know, for the city. And they're like, you know, you're you're a what? What's a CISO? What? Why do we need cyber? What are you talking about? You know, they didn't care. You know, and they didn't have to follow me. You know, and it, going from when you come from DOD when you've got to be this directive and you got to follow NIST and you have to do this and everything is black and white and you have to be doing do 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 you know and it's like you know you can basically hammer people and I come over here and they're telling me to piss off and close the door and and they're going to ignore and then that's where I kind of developed this whole thing about fish tacos and beer and what I did was I reached out to my peers in the other departments and I started taking people to lunch and I was like, tell me about what you're doing. Tell me about your department. What technology are you, are you using? What apps are you using? What projects are you doing? And I would just shut up and take notes. And I would just listen. You know, and what I heard uh, what I heard a lot of was serious professionals, extremely busy, you know, trying to figure out ways to use new technology. And all of it was basically providing services to the citizens, to our neighbors. You know, and how can we do that effectively and be able to protect our data? And we've got a lot of these new smart city projects coming up, and everybody was kind of scared of them because they were so new. And so I saw a lot of different ways in which I could fit in there. And what I found was of the 40 departments, easily half of them didn't really want to chat with me because they didn't know who I was. You know, so they were just kind of like standoffish and just kind of watching me. But the other half, at least 20 of those departments would meet with me, would talk with me. And of those 20, at least 10, I realized were going to be security champions for me. I could right away help them with projects. I could right away, they understood what frameworks were for. They understood about you know, security controls and they got it. You know, they, they, you know, cause, and a lot of them were because they were handling data that was sensitive. And they were already fielding questions from the state of California or from OSHA or from, you know, some of the federal agencies. And so they were concerned about how to protect what they were doing. And so I just, you know, for me, it was low hanging fruit. OK, I'll start with these people first. I will work with them. I'll basically, you know, make my bones and show people that, you know, hey, cybersecurity does have value. And this is how I'm going to help the business. And that's how I started growing, you know, from there. What I, what I realized was that. You know, the team that I was going to build, the department that I was going to build, we were going to be, you know, from like Six Sig, you know, Lean Six Sigma, we were going to be a service oriented organization. We were going to be providing cybersecurity as a service, you know, and over time, you know, my four years there, we got to the point to where we actually were charging back. 
you know, I figured out out of all the services, the technologies that were in my, um, you know, that were in my, uh, in, in, in my budget, there were about 60% of them that were just strictly for me and my team in the security stack to protect the company. But there was about 40% that were specific to the departments. And those I actually charged the seat price for. You know, and so the, the departments already knew when they were doing their budget. All right, I've got 235 people. We need to use VPN. I've got 75 of them that use VPN and VPN costs this per seat. And I was actually doing that. And so I was kind of running almost an internal business to where I was a part of my uh, budget, you know, was being paid for by the departments. And, and then I was working on, okay, how do I get services from DHS? How do I get services from, you know, a lot of these other different agencies, you know, to even, you know, help offset my, my budget. And that's what I did. I mean, you know, I started learning about how to go ahead and use you know, how to basically be able to provide a service internally to the other business units, the other departments, but then also how to use external agencies. You know, and for us, it was MSI SAC and it was DHS and, and how to get services from them. A lot of times how to get services from them for free, you know, and then working with the local fusion center for threat and tell, you know, and we st- I just started weaving these together and, and it took time, you know, and, and I've written articles in this and I've talked about it and I've even recommended for veterans who were leaving that you know if if they're if cyber is a field that they want to get into and they're relatively new to it think about municipal think about coming to work at a city or a state get your feet wet do some good get a chance to see large scale and then when you're ready then jump straight into private industry you know go ahead and still give back you know and so i mean i did i mean those four years were amazing i got a chance to do a lot of stuff that probably CISOs in private industry don't get a chance to do just because I had to build it from scat, you know, from scratch, large scale for a large organization and build out the teams. And we did everything from, you know, cyber operations to e-discovery. They hired a, a chief data officer and had this huge open data project. And we got to work with them extensively. In fact, uh, the chief data officer, his office was right next to mine and we would share tools and chat with each other all the time back and forth because, you know, the city has, most people don't realize it, but cities have amazing amounts of data on citizens and just going back decades, you know, and it's really interesting what you can do with some of those data sets, you know, and, and we, I was helping with projects where we were, we were mapping GPS coordinates, like every manhole cover and every fire hydrant and every facility that had solar power and every tree that the city had planted, you know, and they were building out these maps so they would know what areas were ready for new solar panels. Cause we, we get like 300 days worth of sun a year here in San Diego. And so they were looking at, okay, where, where can we still build out solar, you know, and where's already been kind of filled in. And it was, I have to admit, it was, it was a very interesting four years, but at the end of it, I was ready to go. Yeah, I was ready to go ahead and and try my luck in private industry, which I've had a blast doing. Yeah, last week I was at a conference here in Tampa. Uh, Jeremy Rogers, who just came on board uh, earlier this year uh, as the CISO for the state of Florida. And in his presentation, he was encouraging people to do exactly what you said. He said, consider uh, taking a tour of duty, if you will, uh, and helping out your community, helping out your state, helping out your local government, whatever it is, because there's a lot to be gained from that. And what he even pointed out is much as your observation, these are like separate business units and you have to rely a lot on influence, not like we could do in the Navy where we could issue an order and you would expect compliance. And so it's a real change of strategy in terms of interpersonal dialogue is that as you had said with the fish tacos and beer, if you can't order somebody to do something, you want to encourage them to do it. And if they, start to like you, let's face it, it's one of the principles of persuasion from uh, Dr. Cialdini is liking, is people do tend to do things for people they like rather than people they don't like. And And in the next step, they start to trust you. Right. Because they can see what you're doing. They can see the value of it. They see the impact. They have context. Because I actually opened up my whole budget, all of my projects, Everybody could see what we were working on. We did nothing behind closed doors. I would ask other departments to help us test out technologies for a lot of our security projects. 
And it was really refreshing for a lot of them, you know, because they that was one of their big gripes and complaints was, you know, IT and what security people they had would make changes or would do stuff and never tell anybody. And then all of a sudden things will quit working. <laughs> You know, yeah. Oh yeah, we forgot to mention that. Uh, yeah, where's your? You mean you didn't have an MFA app when we went to require multi-factor authentication? Yeah, so, so it sorry was, about that. Yeah, so it was. I have to admit, you know, and and I, that was just like you said. I mean, it was things that I really had to work on, understanding from a business perspective. Now, how do I work within a business? How do you get that influence, that advocacy, that building that trust, so that you could be effective? You know, and and it is. I mean, it's really crucial, you know, for a CISO. And one of the things you had mentioned, which I think is key, is creating a, a service orientation for cybersecurity. And many folks who grow up in the technical career field, you know, at the extreme, hey, this entire company exists so I can go ahead and red team. Well, no, no, <laughs> it's, it's not unless you're a red teaming company. No, you just have a role to play. But as people promote up through the ranks and they're eventually looking at the CISO, they may not have had to create a service orientation in their past, in their career. They show up, they do their job, they get things done, they exceed the expectations, they do well, they get a bonus, they get a promotion. But at what point in time does a person's viewpoint really need to shift from internal to more external? It's not about you anymore. It's not about how great you are. It's really about what you can deliver. Yeah, I mean, I think once you start, once you start actually managing or leading teams, you then start the, that's where the part of the, having more of the view of what's going on around you, the influence piece starts kicking in. You realize when you start leading teams that, oh, security teams, yeah, we're going to need people over in IT to help us. And we can't piss these people off, you know, because, because their stack and our stack are intertwined and we kind of actually have to work together, you know, and it does help if you guys, you know, trust each other and at least on a friendly basis so you can get things done. You know, as a as a team lead in charge of a team, you start understanding more about impact, about what your team is doing, what your projects are doing, impact on the business, whether negative or positive. You know, you start getting this 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 larger view. You know, once you start stepping beyond just the daily doing the daily maintenance you know and I, and I do i think when you when you start getting to that level and then it just starts increasing from there you know you start out you start realizing the the soft skills that you're going to need to be effective once you start leading people once you start mentoring people and you need them to go ahead and you know excel and be able to do their jobs well you know, not just well for the department, so the department looks good, but well for the business itself. You know, and it, it, it does. It, it's you know, it's one of those things that um, I honestly think you grow into. And there's there's a lot of discussion right now in the CISO community. You shift from being a tactical CISO when you're you know one that's hands on when you're with a smaller company and you've got smaller teams. And then as the company grows, you kind of grow into being more of a strategic system. And I think there's actually some truth to that. And the fact that when you're in larger organizations, you, especially if you're at the executive level where you should be at with the executive team, there's a lot more business that's involved, a lot more of the, you know, stuff that's non-technical related, you know, that, that's involved that you need to be able to do to be effective for your security program, for helping your partners, for the third party vendors and people that you're dealing with, for the large projects that are going on within the, the various business units and the risk. Because you know, for me, I always looked at cybersecurity, the service that I would provide, you know, providing cyber, it's really the management of risk using people, technology, tools, services to manage risk. It's really what it is, you know, and it's, but it's systemic risk. There's a big difference. And what I mean by that is it's risk in small pieces that are all intertwined together with decisions that have been made about technology. And sometimes you don't understand the impact or the domino effect if you pull one or switch one, or change one. And my job is to understand these various levels of risk, how they're intertwined together, so that when the company is making business decisions, because, hey, we're gonna pivot, and now we're gonna do this product, or we're gonna partner here, you know, and 
I need to understand how that risk is intertwined. And my program that I'm running, my teams that I'm helping lead and manage and mentor need to have the tools in place so that we're able to monitor that risk and we can see it and we can see when that risk goes off the rails, you know, and so we can bring it up and say, hey, what are we as a team going to do? Because I don't own that risk. The business owns it. You know, I'm the steward of the the governance side, the technology side, the operations side that manages and protects the company from that risk. But the company and all of us together as a team on the leadership you know, team, we have to make decisions on what we're going to do with that risk. Are we going to accept it? Are we going to go ahead and kick it to the curb and, and change as a company? Are we going to give it to a third party? You know, there's a lot of different decisions we need to go ahead and make. I've run into so many times where I've dealt with CISOs who were just stressing out because they believed they owned it. And I'm like, no, how can you own something if you don't even own the decisions that cause the risk? You know, so, so how can you own it? How can you be held liable and they're going to fire you for something that you, had, that you didn't even create? And that comes back down to, to if you will, the politics is, this, is the S in your title scapegoat. Are you the chief internal scapegoat officer? Yeah, when something goes wrong, we want to get you. Yeah, but I'm, and I said I'm right there with you, and I can't count the number of times when I presented to boards, I make that, you know, I go ahead and I explain the whole dealing with risk is not on me. It's on us as a team. Mm -hmm. And I've no, never had one push back and say, no, it's on you. You know, so, so far I'm doing good. So far, so good, right? Well, yeah. So, so some of your CISO assignments, you, you went from the city of San Diego, which is basically a service-oriented organization, if you will, to Webroot, which is, if you would, more of a product-oriented yep. organization. And now looking at what you're doing at SoftBank, where kind of the service is a product. Uh, what differences in the role of a CISO have you seen in how the company or the organization fits between that service versus a product scale? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you as the in the city, you're extremely hands-on. You're using a lot of the, you know, out there uh, shaking hands and kissing babies and talking with the departments and building trust. Just because people, the city's so large with 12,000 employees spread across 40 plus square miles, you know, in all these various departments. You know, a lot of these departments are almost, you know, individual organizations unto themselves, you know, and it's like, um, you know, so you're extremely busy, you know, interfacing with these various departments and keeping those relationships up and establishing credibility and plus, you know, running your program. It's, um, it's almost a, it is, it is a basically a 24 seven, you know, operation. And then when I switch to the product side, there, instead of like at, actually, you know, at the city of San Diego, it was all kind of internal. There, I'm doing cyber operations, but we're providing services to SMB and MSPs. And part of my job, besides doing internal cyber operations and also working with the dev teams and also doing GRC, was on the product side, interfacing with our customers. And so I did. I actually spent a lot of time with customers. Spent a lot of time with our large MSP customers. This was when I was at Webroot. I did a lot of, you know, writing and keynote speaking and visiting and, you know, and meeting people. And it was the first time where we're at the city of San Diego. A lot of the changes, the impact, a lot of the things that you're doing from a security team are all internal. You know, and you'd see the impact and stuff on the various departments. and you're looking for the greater good of being able to provide services to our citizens here. On the other hand, we're doing everything internal and we're providing a product and you'd see almost an immediate impact on our customers, you know, and our customers could be, you know, a mom and pop dentist office down the street or, you know, a car dealership or, I mean, because we, you know, at, at Webroot, it was interesting because we were not enterprise. We were, we had about 70% of the SMB space and about 30% of the MSP space. So it was a very different, you know, area of, uh, of business. And you got a chance, and that's actually my, my, my third book, The Essentials of Cybersecurity for SMBs. It was because of my experience at soft, you know, I mean, it was my, my experience at Webroot that I wrote that book. 
you know, because as my, as at, at WebRoot, I dealt with all of these SMBs and a lot of them had small teams, you know, or they only had one or two people that were doing security and they needed to know where to start. And they were trying to figure out how to do stuff. And I would give my time and would go ahead and talk with a lot of my customers, you know, at, at, at WebRoot. And it was in that process that I started writing articles to try to address some of the things, some of the problems that they had. And then I put it all together and wrote that book. But it was, and it was for that, you know, and, but yeah, it was very distinct. Yeah, I would say about 60% of the security was the same, but it was very different where one was more out, you know, outward bound or another, and the other one was more inward, you know, kind of facing. And then at, and at SoftBank, it's everything. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's what I said. You got to kind of do a little bit of all. And, and it's so really there's a bit of a hierarchy that's out there. You know, people can approach their careers from different directions, but yep. to get to a point where in your current uh, domain of responsibility, where, as they say, it's product, it's service, it's customers, it's internal or external, you really are then at that point, uh, a chief, you know, the C is, is earned at that head table rather than somebody who maybe pays lip service to say, oh yeah, I guess we've got computers and we'll call it a CISO and make them feel good. Uh, you're actually part and parcel of the ability of that organization to deliver on their promise to their customers. And, and that's huge. Well, and I think that's, I think that's the, the next step that we're starting to see where the role itself, especially when you get into the senior, you know, the senior level of uh, the, the CISO role right now, it is starting to be more involved with the C-suite, you know, starting to be on boards now. Or at least you know being on the audit committee that reports to the board, and to me it makes sense with all of the risks and the threats involved now, right now with cybersecurity, and I don't see them going away. I see them escalating. It makes sense that you would have somebody who's a who's both a technical and a strategic expert, you know, within that specialty, you know, serving on a board, you know, to go ahead and be able to talk about those types of systemic risks, and you know, and I do think that there's a lot more movement to that. Now, of course, you know, there's, it's, you know, it's, it's basically a coin, you know, you flip it one side, you know, Hey, we don't really need it. The other side, yeah, we do need it, but it's relying on the CISOs actually have to educate themselves. They have to be willing to step in and take on that extra level of responsibility, you know, and be accountable and stuff. And, and, you know, you run into boards thinking that we're not ready for it. I think we are. I think we're, I think the role is maturing. I mean, it's getting to the point to where there's a lot of us in the executive ranks that are ready for our first board role, that are ready to go ahead and start serving at an executive level. And I think that would be an important uh, to, to see these larger organizations, if you will, giving security a seat at the grown-ups table. You know, for those of us in the military, remember, you know, the admiral sat at the table, and then the horse holders, the, you know, whether it was the captains or the colonels or the majors, we'd all sit around the wall. And uh, then when they needed something, they'd lean over their shoulder. Hey, Gary, what do you think? And like, yes, sir, it looks good. Now, you had brought up a couple of times a concept that we had discussed previously about the tactical versus strategic. And what I wanted to do is kind of view that from the perspective of a CISO versus a VCSO. And I've had friends who have been successful in a CISO career. They've done two or three CISO tours. They said, hey, I think I'd like to become a VCSO. And I've done my VC so work, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe maybe the grass is greener over there. But here's my assertion: it's the null hypothesis, which you can see easily argue about, and that's what I'm hoping we'll get some different perspectives on this. Being a virtual CISO requires greater technical expertise because the organization rarely is large enough to have a full IT security team, which is why you're a virtual CISO, and therefore you don't have any staff to fall back on, and you have to be the technical expert of last resort when it comes to security. As compared to a CISO, where presumably you do have a staff and you can delegate things out to people who know what is going on. So with that as a premise, what are your thoughts? I'd have to, I guess I'd have to argue on that one just because of, I'd like to give you an idea right now, you know, at SoftBank, the CISO doing cyber operations for SoftBank Investment Advisors for the Vision Fund and the Vision Fund 2 and a couple of other funds. <laughs> it's kind of, they keep on adding. But on top of doing, you know, um, regular security operations work as a CISO, I also handle audit. I also work with uh, compliance and legal and risk. 
And then on top of that, I also do due diligence on new investments. I do the cyber risk due diligence on new investments. I've done roughly about 180 different companies in the last 12 months. Um, SoftBank's very busy. <laughs> you know, and then um, and then I also provide uh, virtual CISO services to the companies that are in our portfolio. Now, some of the companies are very mature. And they don't need anything. And some of them are immature and they'll reach out. And sometimes it's just, you know, hey, we're writing our first sets of policies. Can you help us out? Or, you know, I've had some of the mature ones reach out and say, hey, we really would like, you know, your expertise on our board. Can you be part of our risk committee or part of our audit committee? And and I've done that where I, on a quarterly basis, I go ahead and I um, attend the security or, or risk committee meetings and hear about new projects and, and their strategy and what they're doing. And I help their CISO plan. And then I've had things like, hey, we're hiring our first CISO. Can you look at the candidates that we're looking at? You know, the the virtual CISO stuff is is wide ranging. You know, it isn't really set on, you know, one particular thing. You know, I I know a lot of people that have done virtual CISO work. And like I said, you know, when I left WebRoot, before I went to SoftBank, I did it for about three months, you know, before I went ahead and, and I jumped over. You know, and my thing is, is I have found the more senior you get as a CISO in an organization, the more strategic you become. Okay. And typically your deputy or, or your direct reports will handle more of the technical stuff while you're handling more of the strategic stuff. With that said, each organization is different. I mean, you know, I was I was specifically told here at SoftBank when they hired me that they wanted me to both be both, you know, and which which I can do with, with you know without an issue. Where I've known other organizations where they wanted you to do one or the other. You know, here you were expected to do both because of just the uniqueness of, of my role. I think the thing with virtual CISO is that you've, you know, between that and regular CISO is that with the virtual CISO, you've got flexibility because you need to do not only, I guess what it is with a virtual CISO is you have to keep your technical skills up to date because you never know when you're going to need them. And then it also helps if you know some strategic skills as well, because sometimes one of these companies that you know reaches out to you, hey, we don't really need the technical piece. We've got some good security engineers that are handling that. We need more of the strategic stuff. Help us plan the security program because we're going to the next stage and help us figure out the job description for the CISO that we need to hire and help us figure out how this role is going to interact with our other departments or our other business units. You, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, or, hey, we're just not there yet. We're just going to be kind of stay in place. We got a security engineer that's doing, you know, everything. But can you kind of like provide, you know, over the shoulder assistance and assist them and making sure that, you know, at least they're following the basic controls that we need because we think we're eventually going to go SOC 2, you know. And so it's, I, th I think you got to do both. That's where I think the virtual CISO is kind of interesting is that you have to keep both you know, current, because you don't really know what you're going to need from company to company that you're going to work at. Where in a regular CISO role, it helps having both, but I do think as you mature, one tends to become more dominant than the other. And and that makes perfect sense to me. And again, yeah. it's, it's based on the business, you know. Um, yeah, and hopefully you have, uh, or you can build an effective team as a CISO, so that, yeah. as you had said, you can delegate out the technical work, but you can't be clueless. You can't be the one person sitting there with the executives that they turn to and they go, Gary, you're our, our CISO. Tell me about something security related. And you can't give them a deer in the headlights and say, well, let me, let me, let me go get the guy in the back room or get the lady in the back yeah. room who knows this stuff and bring her up forward. Uh, so I, I agree that as you progress in your career, strategic is absolutely much more of a focus. And the tactical if you will, the technical it kind of falls into what I had coined years ago as G Mark's law. And it was kind of you know, a good idea at the time. I think it's still true. Half of what you know about security will be obsolete in 18 months. And it just basically addresses the fact that when we're in such a fast changing technical environment, that the key to being effective as a technical expert 
is continuous education. And you've certainly provided in your writing some amazing work. I mean, the CISO Desk Reference Guide, it's two volumes. You said you just came, came out with the Essential Guide to Cybersecurity for SMBs. Tell me a little bit about your writing and uh, your ability to contribute to the community that way. You know, it's it's actually kind of funny. The uh, My co-authors and I, we were actually at a cyber startup event. And over a couple of beers, we were chatting. And I had already started writing some articles you know, about cybersecurity, and they were really for vets that were transitioning. And I was, you know, coming into cybersecurity and it just happened. And Matt Stamper, I remember, you know, had said, dude, you need to write a book. And, you know, and Bill Bonney was sitting there with me and us three were talking and Matt was like, well, you need to write a book. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I was like, I was like, writing a book's a lot of work, dude. And I said, you know, why don't we write a book? You know, and then uh, and that's when Bill stepped in and says, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Why don't we write a book? And it was, uh, and that kind of, and that was in 2015, 26, I think that was 2015 when we come up with the idea. You know, we decided, okay, let's, let's do this, you know, and, and it was interesting. I mean, we, we kind of had an idea what we wanted to write and I had a whole huge, you know, question and answer bank from um, that I'd been keeping all these questions and stuff that people ask me for like different panels and different boards and different things that I had sat on over the years doing keynotes and everything like that. And it was about 300 plus questions that I had, you know, being a pack rat that I had. And we were looking through all of these, you know, cyber and technical related questions. And we realized when we started grouping them, we had about 18 chapters worth of content that we could probably discuss. And that's the reason why if you look at volume one and volume two, you'll see there'll be questions that we're answering for each chapter. That's where those questions came from. As we went through them and there were specific ones that we thought would be really interesting to write on. And then Matt Stamper is a, is a mind map, you know, uh, he's a mind map nut just like myself. I love the mind map stuff. And so we mind mapped out our 18 chapters. We mind mapped out volume one and volume two, what we were going to cover, what questions we wanted to do. And then when we started writing, we were like, okay, well, how, how are the three of us going to write a chapter? And when we started talking, what we realized was Bill Bonney, you know, prior uh, CISO at Intuit, he's executive level, 30,000 foot level, very strategic. You know, Matt, you know, Matt has been a CISO, he's been a CIO, he's been a consultant, he's worked at Gartner, he's run data centers. He tends to write at the 10,000 foot level, you know, where it's, you know, and where it can be very broad, very technical, really good writer. I'm just a chief petty officer <laughs> yeah, for the U.S. Navy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm used to running. That's the teams. backbone of the Navy, by yeah. the way. You realize? Yeah, that. I'm used to being at the at the, at the, at the deck plate level and leading teams. And I mean, hell, I had my Cisco certs all the way up to like three or four years ago, even though I didn't need them. But I still kept, you know, because I love networks. And so I tend to write at the hundred foot level. And so when you go ahead and you read each chapter, you get strategic all the way down to technical and everything in between. So you get three different points of view about how you would address the specific questions that we're talking about. So you get the the technical and the strategic points of view. And then at the end of it, we sum it up and then we give you takeaways at the end of the chapter so that by the end of the book, you know, there's nine chapters in each book, you've got, you know, a good amount of takeaways that you can, you know, take with you and immediately start doing with your team or immediately start doing with for yourself as you're becoming a CISO. And, you know, and so I've always written you know, at that at that kind of level as to uh, this is how you would do things and this is why this is, don't do it this way. Here's some issues that I've seen, you know. So and again it's a it's a mentoring, it's a servant leadership type level that and it was just the way I was raised in the military. It's the way I, you know, over twenty plus years in IT and cybersecurity, it's how I, you know, basically grew up, you know, in in, in the tech industry, um, was doing it that way and leading teams that way. And working with boards and working with executives that way and walking them through it and showing them and explaining it to them. And I can get very strategic. That's why I went and did my MBA so I could better understand how to talk on the business side. So I can get very strategic and leave all that technical stuff behind and be able to explain it in very easy business terms. But I love doing both. You know, and so, you know, the CISO Desk Reference Guide Volume 1 and Volume 2 is for the CISOs. 
the essential guide that I wrote is for the small businesses. The fourth book I wrote, you know, developing your uh, cybersecurity program, that one I wrote with two other co-authors, and that's for people coming into cyber starting from scratch. And that's like how to write your resume, how to do a job interview, how to work with a recruiter. And that's getting people started. And then the most recent book that my that you know Matt and Bill and I put together was the Executive Primer. The Executive Primer is taking everything from volume one and two and flipping it on its head because the executive primary is not written from the CISO point of view, it's written from the CEO's point of view, from the CFO's point of view, from the board's point of view of, hey, this is the CISO role, this is what they do, this is how they run security programs, this is how you should work with them. You know, and we've had, I've had a bunch of CEOs that have reached out that want the book. And that sounds great, and I'm thinking, for CISOs and my friends who look at the desk reference guy, go like, that's over 750 pages. Where am I going to find the time for that? I said, wait a minute, this guy is a CISO and he found the time to write it. And oh, yeah. so thank you again for your contribution that you continue to make to the community. Well, you know, what I found is, you know, if, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, I put about a hundred plus articles up there because I, I continuously write. And then the books that we've written. And what's interesting is I find people that want the book they want it in their hands so they can read it and go through it. But then they also buy the ebook version that they put on their tablet with them because they're constantly taking notes. And it's and I can't I can't tell you the the number of people I've run into around the world because the book's in multiple languages. <laughs> you know, and just the people I run into at conferences who who've used it for different things, you know, who you know, who who reach out and are asking like, you know, like the essentials guide I wrote several years ago, and I'm actually uh, I'm writing an update to it now. I'm going through it and I'm updating content, you know, to it now because I'm constantly learning myself. You know, I'm working on AWS certs. I'm doing different things. I'm always doing, you know, working on something. And, and then, you know, this whole experience at SoftBank of being in a complete 100% cloud environment, it's really changed my view on controls and it's changed my approach on doing security. And so I want to write about that, you know, because there's not a lot of systems that are in that environment yet. But when they do go ahead and eventually transition into a full 100% cloud environment, there's some things they need to know. You know, when you're dealing with 300 plus SaaS apps, it's a whole different ball game, <laughs> you know, and security is at the data layer. And now all of a sudden you're really worried about IAM and, you know, do I have MFA and, and you know, and, and hey, you know, should I make sure everything is single sign-on capable? And yeah, there's a lot of stuff that all of a sudden becomes critical because now security is down at the data layer and it's, uh, and it becomes very personal. It's on the endpoint and it's on the edge, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, you know, for me writing about this stuff and teaching and it's something that, you know, Rick McElroy and I talked about several years ago when we presented at RSA, we actually did a talk on, on why the CISO role sucks and what we need to do to fix it. <laughs> and, and one of the things we talked about in there was about leaving a legacy, you know, cause when you really think about it, we're only at this for about another 10, 15 years. Who are the CISOs coming up behind us? Mm -hmm. Who's training them? You know, who's prepping them to go ahead and step into these roles as we move on to boards or move on to being a VC or move on to consultant work or move on to, you know, just teaching at university and kind of enjoying semi-retirement? You know, who's stepping into the roles behind us? Who's training and mentoring them? And, and that's something I think we got from our, our Navy experience is that you always train your replacement. I had a friend of mine well, I went to school with, and she went off to General Motors, and she was going to become the first female chairman of General Motors. In fact, she uh, left GM, ended up you know, having you know, three daughters, all engineers, by the way, great kids. Uh, and the lady who was the first chairman of General Motors joined the company the same year she did. But I remember when we were trading notes, I'd been in the Navy a couple of years, and she's telling me about what's going on. I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a chance to go from division officer to department head. I'm going to be training this person to do the job. And she's like, what do you mean? You're training somebody? I go, yes. I mean, you can't get promoted if you can't get someone else to do your job. And in her environment, it may not be this way today, years later, but in her environment, it's like, you don't do anything for anybody else because they'll just steal your stuff. And it was just such an adversarial environment, not just management to worker, but peer to peer in the management world. And yet I think you embody that sense of, hey, let's pass it on to the next generation. Let's empower people to be at least as successful as we are and hopefully 
more successful in the future. And, and for that, I, I salute you and thank you very much for your contributions. Well, I mean, I've, I've had people ask us, you know, when you build your teams and you, you know, and you've got this talent, well, what do you do if, if, if they leave you? And I'm like, to me, they're just graduating. Because I've, I've got certain roles, they're at specific levels. I can't just automatically, boom, you know, make them a VP or something. You know, I mean, I've, you know, my, my team's at a specific level. They're going to get experience. They're going to be able to go to conferences and stuff. But sooner or later, in their career path and their progression, they're going to be ready for a role or they're going to be ready for a specific level I may not have. And it's not my job to step in their way. It's my job to prepare them. And if they leave, they leave. And I bring in somebody behind and, and I continue on, you know, running my teams. You know, and my thing is everybody that I've had that has basically graduated and has moved on, I know where they're at. And many of them have actually followed me, you know, from one job to the next. You know, when I've had, you know, when I've switched different roles. I mean, that's one nice thing about the fact that, you know, you don't burn those bridges. You train, you mentor you know, from a servant leadership perspective, you give and you help them in their careers and it comes back to you because there's times where you may need somebody. Why not take somebody that you trust, someone that you've trained, someone that you know can do the job, you know, and it's like, um, and so I, you know, I have no problem with that. And, you know, and, and some of mine now are, are coming into their first CISO, their first director roles, which I think are pretty cool, you know, to go ahead and see people grow. Mm -hmm. You know, see, you know, people that I've known that were, you know, analysts who are now getting into their first director role. You know, they're running multiple teams. They're uh, they're contacting me about, you know, about how to do budget. <laughs> they're contacting me about, hey, I'm doing my first uh, board call. Uh, what do you think about? And I'm like, you know, I covered that in volume one. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, by the way, here's a link to Amazon if you want to go yeah. ahead and, down and buy it right now. But uh, but but it's but it's like you know. I, to this day, I still mentor, you know, I've still, I got multiple people that I'm mentoring right now. And mm -hmm. I just, I don't know what I would do without doing it. I mean, I think it would be a very boring place. You know, I mean, you know, the, the cyber, our, our community is so close knit. And I have to admit, there's a lot of interesting characters and amazing people, you know, within the community. And I'm just, I enjoy being a part of it, you know, and and just being able to give back and being able to help it grow. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I think that's great. So it's, this has been a real privilege. We're kind of getting close to time here. Are there any last thoughts you'd like to, to leave us with or any you know, ideas? You know, the, the biggest thing, like I said, is the um, for those that are coming in, self-care. You know, whether you're an analyst or whether you're an engineer or an architect, this job will eat you up because it's 24 seven. It's nonstop. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's highly stressful, you know, so take care of yourself, take some time off, take vacations when you can. If you're working in teams, take care of each other, you know, whether it's through faith and physical fitness and, you know, and peers and, you know, mentors, make sure you take care of yourself. Uh, the more senior level people, you know, give back to the community, get involved, get involved in the various groups, write, keynote, uh, mentor where you can. That's what makes this community, to me, it's just, it's just an amazing place. It's just the involvement from everybody. You know, um, don't just don't stand on the sidelines and just take. Be willing to give. You know, uh, be willing to step in and go ahead and give your time. It will come back in multiple folds to you. You know, and I, I really think that... Um, and that's, you know, really what I have to say is just that, you know, you need to be able to take care of yourself and take care of each other and give back to the community. Well, Gary, I think that's wonderful advice and, and a lot of wisdom there. So I, I'd like to thank you uh, on behalf of our, of our listeners for spending the time with me today on the CISO Tradecraft uh, podcast. And for those listening, if you have enjoyed today's show, send it to someone at work or subscribe to make sure you hear more great content. We'd love to hear about your success stories. And uh, if you've got any comments, send it to us at CISOTradeCraft.com or reach out to us on LinkedIn. We'd love to share the impact of our show is making with others. And this is your host, G. Mark Hardy, and thanks again for listening. And until the next time, stay safe.